If you need to pass GED Social Studies, know that I've put together this video with tips and tricks and strategies and practice questions to help you pass GED Social Studies so that you can move ahead to bigger and better things in life like college or a better job, and we're gonna get started right now. So the next two questions are gonna involve using this passage here as well as the graph on screen. Now it says the national debt is the amount of money the federal government has borrowed. During a given fiscal year, if the amount the government spends, for example, on fixing bridges, exceeds the amount the government makes, for example, from collecting federal income tax, it leads to a budget deficit. A fiscal year is a one-year period which the government and companies use to report finances and set budgets. A company bases its federal tax filings, financial reports, and external audits on its fiscal year. The federal government has several options to pay for this deficit, such as selling treasury bonds, bills, notes, floating rate notes, and treasury inflation protected securities. The accumulation of this borrowing combined with the related interest the government owes to the investors who bought these securities makes up the national debt. Which of the following is the best strategy to allow the U.S. government to lower its debt? A. Selling fewer treasury inflation protected securities. B. Spending more money to fix bridges and roads. C. Raising taxes. Or D. Introducing Supreme Court justice term limits. Now we have this graph over here. This says debt in billions rounded. Um, and this down here says the end of the fiscal year and it goes from 2010 to 2015. So let's have you pause the video if you want to. Try to figure this question out. Maybe reread if you have to. Take all the time you need, and then when you're ready, just unpause the video and we'll go over the solution. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to try this if you wanted to. So, so let me give you a little tip here. If we look at the answer choice D, know that it says introducing Supreme Court justice term limits. Well, did the passage or the graph have anything to do with the Supreme Court? No, the Supreme Court was not mentioned. Uh, term limits weren't mentioned. So if you ever see an answer choice on your test that introduces a topic that uh, wasn't mentioned in the passage, it's probably a safe bet that you can eliminate that answer choice. So we'll take D out because the Supreme Court didn't come up at all in the passage. Okay, so let's now go look at A and let's look at B here. So selling fewer treasury inflation protected securities, well, we know here that uh, it says the federal government has several options to pay the deficit. So one of the options they would use to pay the deficit uh, and to try to essentially lower that national debt would be to sell treasury bonds and to sell treasury inflation protected security. So just based off of this passage here without knowing anything about treasury inflation protected securities, which I know nothing about, okay, since we see in the passage here that if they're going to, if the government uh, can try to sell more of these to pay down the deficit, all right, we can assume that selling fewer of them is not going to be the best strategy to lower the debt, all right? Again, if the government has several options to pay for the deficit, one of these would be selling treasury inflation protected securities. Without knowing anything about that topic, uh, it seems to make sense that selling fewer of these, fewer treasury inflated protected securities is not going to be the best way to lower the debt. So we're left with B and C, all right? And another crucial point to understand here is that it tells us up here, I think it's in the second sentence, that the government, uh, the amount the government spends could be, for example, on bridges, it could be on roads. So if they're gonna spend money and fix bridges and roads, that might be great if that's in your community where they're improving the bridges and roads, but their government's gonna be spending more money, okay, which in turn can run up the debt, all right? So spending more money on, on bridges and roads might be great for the community, okay, but that can add to the amount that the government spends. So B is going to be out. All right. So also note here, it says, uh, you know, the amount the government makes, for example, from collecting income taxes. So if the government raises taxes and they take in more money, that according to this passage here, all right, would be the best strategy compared to A, B, and D. So C is the right answer here. Okay, so now we see that we've got the same passage here. We've got the same exact graph on the screen. The only difference is the question, so I'm not going to reread the passage or the, or the graph. Uh, it's okay if you want to pause the video and reread them, but basically the question is now asking, which of the following answer choices best describes the trend seen in the graph above? A, the debt increased from 2010 to 2012, then decreased from 2013 to 2015. 
B. The debt decreased from 2010 to 2012, then increased from 2013 to 2015. C. The debt decreased from 2010 to 2015. Or D. The debt increased from 2010 to 2015. So now's your chance to pause the video if you want to. Maybe reread this, take all the time you need to study the graph and study the question. Then when you're ready, just unpause the video and we'll talk about it. And it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong, we're just practicing. It's all about the knowledge right now. So don't beat yourself up if you struggle with this. And just whenever you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over it. Okay, so let's talk about this question here. So if I look at the top of each of these bars, and if I imagine I've got a little stick figure right here, Okay, so imagine that each of the, these bars kind of makes a staircase. Okay. And if I imagine the stick figure is going to start from the left and is just going to follow the staircase up to the right, all right, we see that with each step, the person is going to be going up the staircase. All right. So in other words, from left to right, all right, we see that there is an increase. All right, now if the person maybe went up a couple steps and then back down a couple steps, then up a couple steps and back down a couple steps, you know, or something like that, or if there were no steps, if the person went just straight across or something like that, that would represent no change. Um, but we don't see an increase, then a decrease. We don't see a decrease or an increase. It's just a straight upward trend right here. All right, so. Um, you know, maybe you don't need to think about it like a stick figure here. Uh, maybe you can just kind of look at this and just, just break it down and just kind of see that, hey, you know, each bar is a little bit higher than the one before it. All right, that shows an increase. However you want to think about it, the answer is D. So if you got that right, great job. If not, don't worry about it. There'll be other questions here for you to try. The American Revolutionary War was fought from 1775 to 1783. Following the American Revolution, the War of 1812 was fought from 1812 to 1815. The U.S. Civil War was fought from 1861 to 1865. Some historians consider World War II to be an extension of World War I. World War I took place between 1914 and 1918, while World War II occurred from 1939 to 1945. The Marshall Plan, which was also known as the European Recovery Program, was enacted in 1948 to provide aid to Western Europe following the destruction of the region. Named after U.S. Secretary of State George C. Marshall, the Marshall Plan provided over $15 billion to help rebuild Western Europe. In addition to re... To re sorry. In addition to reconstructing cities damaged during the war... It's a tongue twister. The Marshall Plan also aimed to remove trade barriers between European neighbors. Also, the Marshall Plan aimed to prevent the spread of communism on the European continent. Following the war, conflict between the ideas of capitalism and communism escalated. Communist societies believed in redistributing wealth, classless societies, and state-run economies. On the other hand, capitalist societies believed in allowing the free market to determine the production and distribution of goods. So here's your question. The Marshall Plan was enacted immediately following which war? A. The U.S. Civil War B. The War of 1812 C. World War II or D. The American Revolutionary War So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need to study this passage, maybe reread if you need to, and whenever you're ready, unpause the video and we'll go over the answer. Okay, so basically there are, you kind of have to put together information from two parts of the passage here. So first you have to see that the Marshall Plan was enacted in 1948. And the second piece of information is you have to look at the dates of the different wars here. And you have to see that World War II occurred from 1939 to 1945. So... The Marshall Plan was enacted after each of the wars that occurred here, right? The Civil War occurred, and then the Marshall Plan came after the Civil War. It came after the War of 1812. It came after the American Revolutionary War, but it was not immediately enacted after the Civil War. Okay, it was not immediately enacted after the War of 1812. So this enacted immediately following, that's just kind of another way of saying, you know, which war did the Marshall Plan directly come after? And if we look 
The Marshall Plan was enacted in 48. World War II occurred from 1939 to 1945. You know, it's talking about in the passage that there was destruction, you know, and following the war, there was a conflict between ideas. It's talking about World War II here, all right? So you just have to see these dates here, see that 1945 was the end of World War II, 48 was the when the Marshall Plan was enacted. So immediately following World War II, we could see that the Marshall Plan was enacted, all right? So C is the correct answer to this question. So the next question says, if James Madison was the American president during the War of 1812, which of the following is most likely true based on the information in the paragraph above? A. James Madison advocated for reconstructing damaged infrastructure in Western Europe. B. James Madison served as the U.S. president from 1809 to 1817. C. James Madison aimed to prevent the spread of communism on the European continent. Or D. Thomas Jefferson served as James Madison's vice president. So let's have you pause the video, and if you need to, you can reread this. Take all the time you need to search the passage for the answer here. And when you're ready, just unpause the video and we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's talk about this here. So it's important to know, at least when you're practicing, to think about why a question is wrong, not just why it would be right, or I'm sorry, why an answer choice is wrong. All right, because on the test, you know, you're going to get some answer choices. You're not sure if they're right or wrong, and, and it's, it's helpful to have kind of a thought process to go through here. So the first thing I note here is Thomas Jefferson is coming up here, and also I see the words vice president. Now, the passage doesn't mention Thomas Jefferson, and it doesn't mention James Madison uh, or his vice president, really. So we can rule D out because it's adding information, in this case, Thomas Jefferson, uh, it's adding the information that was not mentioned in the passage. So D is probably a safe bet to rule it out. Okay. So C, James Madison aimed to prevent the spread of communism on the European continent. So we ta it talks about in the passage um, that the Marshall Plan was enacted to uh, prevent the spread of communism. However, all right, this is, it says, which is most likely true? This is most likely not true because... The Marshall Plan was 1948, all right, James Madison was uh, president during 1812, all right, so the Marshall Plan was over 100 years later after he served during the war, so that's why we could take C out. Really the same with A here. It says James Madison advocated for reconstructing damaged infrastructure in Western Europe. Well, that does happen here, right, in the passage. Uh, uh, it does talk about infrastructure uh, and rebuilding Western Europe, all right. However, that was something that occurred after World War II, immediately after World War II, um, and when the Marshall Plan was enacted in 1948, which was over 100 years after the War of 1812. So just from knowing that the War of 1812, uh, it says up here it took place between 1812 and 1815, who would have guessed that it would have started in 1812, right? Um, so, you know, the dates 1812 to 1815, knowing Madison was president during 1812, all right, B is the most logical answer choice here. So this question is still using the same passage here, and it says, which term is related to the ideas of capitalism? Is it A, absence of private property, B, absence of social classes, C, private enterprise, or D, common ownership of resources? So let's have you pause the video, take all the time you need with this question, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So the tests are randomized, so there's not, no one knows exactly which questions you're going to get on your test or which types of questions, but capitalism and communism uh, come up in questions a lot, I've heard people say. Again, there's no guarantee you'll get these topics on your test, but from hearing from a lot of people, they do show up quite a bit, so uh, there's a decent chance that you'll get something having to do with capitalism and communism. And this paragraph here really is your key to getting this question right, as you probably saw when you tried the question. Um, but basically, a couple of things to know, communist societies basically believed in redistributing wealth. So what does redistributing wealth mean? Essentially, you're, you're taking wealth from, uh, you know, the wealthy people, and you're going to give it out to the people that don't have as much money. Now, a classless society would be Unlike, uh, basically, for example, in the U.S., where you've got, like, middle class, you've got uh, upper class, you've got upper middle class, um, class of society would be everybody's roughly equal, um, and that's a, another feature of a communist society. 
and also a state-run economy. So a state-run economy basically means the government controls the economy. So those are a few things to know about communism here. Um, and capitalist societies, which the U.S. is not 100% capitalist, but it's generally thought of as capitalist society. So for capitalism, you can kind of think about the U.S., um, but capitalist societies believed in allowing the free market to determine the production and distribution of goods. So let's go through the answer choices here. Absence of private property. So private property and owning your own property, that is an idea that is um, associated with capitalism. Okay, so absence of private property is associated with communism. So we're going to take A out because the absence of private property is associated with communism. Okay, so B, absence of social classes. So right here it tells us classless societies is a feature of communism. So B is not an idea associated with capitalism. All right. So what about D, common ownership of resources? Well, that is a feature of communism. All right. Like, again, you know, rather than one person owns a field or one person owns a lot or a park or one person owns a house, there'd be common ownership of resources, meaning maybe the whole community, you know, owns a park or something like that, just as an example off the top of my head. But this common ownership of resources, that is a feature of communism. So let me take that out. Now, C, private enterprise, or another way to put that would be, you know, owning your own business or starting your own business. Um, rather than having the government control all the businesses, that would be a feature of uh, capitalism. Okay, so C is the correct answer here. So it'd be a good idea to just keep keep points in the fall in the last paragraph here, just to keep these points in mind. And even these answer choices here note that um, A, B, and D are associated with communism, and C is associated with capitalism. Just something good to keep in mind here. Um, the GED testing service says that the GED is not a memorization test, so if you want further clarification on if you have to memorize stuff, I would have you ask the GED testing service because that's what they say, it's not a memorization test. All right, however, in my opinion, you know, I've been on YouTube since I think 2017, you know, I have uh, tutored many students in person, you know, in my opinion, knowing a little bit about this capitalism and communism stuff is only going to help you out. And the same with this first paragraph here with, with these wars. Now, again, you know, you're not going to get a test that tells you, that, that asks you, oh, when was the Revolutionary War? Was it in 1775? Was it in 1914? All right, I very highly doubt you're going to get a question like that unless they give you a passage where you read something about it, all right? But that being said, you know, having a good general idea of when these wars took place, in my opinion, is going to help you out. So, for example... You know, if I were to ask you which war was fought in the late 1800s, all right, you should know that that was the Civil War, all right? You don't have to memorize exactly it was 1861 to 65, you know, but just having a general idea of when that occurred. You know, uh, if I were to ask you right now, um, you know, which war took place in the late 1700s, you know, um, do you think of the American Revolutionary War, all right? You know, it's just stuff like that. And again, the GED testing service says it's not a memorization test, all right? So you don't have to memorize these exact dates. But in my opinion, you know, it, it's only going to help you to have a general idea of when the wars were fought, all right? I'm not trying to trick you or confuse you. Sometimes when I talk about memorizing, is this a memorization test and things to know, people get confused. And so I'm just basically telling you, in my opinion, there's some things that would be good to know ahead of time going into your test. All right, but the testing service claim it's not a memorization test. Which of the following is false based on the data shown in the graph? So right here we see the graphs. It says female senators in the U.S. Congress versus session of Congress. And so on our Y or our up and down axis, we see female senators in the U.S. Congress. And down here on our horizontal axis, we see the session of Congress ranging from 102 to 108. So the answer choice is A. From session 105 to 106, the number of female senators stayed the same. B. From session 106 to 108, the number of female senators increased. C. Overall, from session 102 to 108, the number of female senators increased. Or D. From session 104 to 106, the number of female senators decreased. So let's have you pause the video, try this question out, and then when you're ready, We'll go over how to do this, and if you get stuck, don't worry, because we're just going to go over how to do it. Okay, so let's talk about this question here. So let me show you kind of a method that you can use 
Um, you know, you might be able to just look at this question, look at the graph and get this right. But if you had a little trouble with this, let me give you kind of a method you can use here. So let's go one by one down the answer choices. So A, from session 105 to 106. So answer choice A is making a statement about sessions, what's happening between sessions 105 to 106. So if this is 104 and this is 106, we're going to assume that 105 is going to be about here, right? Right, roughly between 104 and 106. I would say that that's right about right here. Okay. And 106 is right here. So what I'm trying to do here, and obviously you won't be able to draw these black bars on the test like this, okay? But the point is that, you know, for this answer, to verify if A is true or false, we can ignore everything on the graph over here, and we can ignore everything on the graph that's going on over here. We just need to focus our attention to what's happening between these lines here, okay? Because it's the answer choice is making a statement about 105 to 106. So if we look at the blue line, all right, if the blue line uh, was going up, we would say it was an increase. If the blue line was going down, we'd say it was a decrease. But the blue line is perfectly flat here. Okay, so if we bring in our stick figure, all right, we make another guest appearance by my wonderful or actually probably terrible drawing of a stick figure. Okay, and if the stick figure were to start at the left and walk the line, we'd see that they would not be going up or down. So just take away from this that a flat line represents no change on the graph. So A is going to be true. All right, here we're looking for which of the following is false. So since A is a true statement, I can eliminate A. So here's another little tip here, all right? Whenever you get questions saying which of the following is true or which of the following is false, just make a mental note about what it's asking you because sometimes people get confused about it's easy to kind of just read the question too fast and then, you know, think you're answering which of the following is true when you're supposed to be answering which of the following is false. All right, so A is a true statement. So we're going to take it out because we're looking for a false statement. So it's just hard to keep that straight sometimes in your head. So just make sure that under the stress of a test, you just clarify what the question's asking. So B, from session 106 to 108, the number of female senators increased. So where do you think I'm going to look on the graph here? Well, I'm going to look between 106, which is right here, and 108, which is over here. And again, you're not going to be able to draw on the test, all right? But I'm just trying to kind of give you a method, uh, you know, just so that you can uh, hopefully get more questions right. Now, if you already have a method that you use to answer these questions that's working for you, stick with it. But on um, what we can see here, if we use this method here, you know, we just want to focus on what's going on between 106 to 108. The line goes up and keeps going up. So we would say that, yes, there's an increase during this time period. So both A and B are true. C, overall from session 102 to 108, the number of female senators increased. So if we start down here at 102, and over here is 108. So really this question is asking us about the entire graph here, okay? So if I draw my, bring my little stick figure in for another guest appearance here, okay? What we see here is that if you start at 102, the stick figure is going to go up and keep going up and keep going up and then right here the stick figure is just going to be walking in a straight line either up or down all right but then again once they get to the 106 session they'd be going up and up so the reason that some people perhaps maybe if you thought c was the right answer maybe i'm thinking it's because you looked at this little part of the graph that had no change and you said well there's a part of the graph right between sessions 105 to 106 where there's no change occurring. So therefore, C is, is a false statement. So C is the right answer. Okay, well, actually, the word overall is key here, all right? The question that was asking us overall, so even though there's this one little time period where there was no change in the number of female senators, mostly here, all right, mostly or overall, we see that the number kept increasing. So C is a true statement, so I could take C out, because again, we want to figure out which of the following is false. So by process of elimination, we know that D must be the correct answer, but also if we look at between 104 and 106, 
all right, the graph is going up and then it flatlines right here. We don't see a decrease going on, okay? So we don't see anything like this. We don't see any decrease going on. A decrease would look like this. The blue line would go like this, all right? And the stick figure person going from left to right would be running down a hill. That would be a decrease, which we don't see on this graph, okay? So D is a false statement, meaning it's the correct answer here. Okay, so I know this question kind of throws a lot at you here. And, you know, once you get in the hang of doing this, hopefully you can just kind of glance at it and you can say, well, I need to look between 106 and 108 while the line's going up, so that's an increase. You know, eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to do it that fast, but I'm just breaking it down nice and slow here, hopefully. I know I talk fast, but hopefully I'm breaking this down in a way that's easy to understand, so if you get a question like this, you'll be able to get it right on your test. So the first champion shout out goes to a test taker who says that I failed my social studies by seven points the first try, then by one point my second try, which is really, really close and that's really frustrating. So I just want to, you know, wish this test taker luck with uh, the next attempt here. And we're all in this together. I know that sometimes there's going to be setbacks, there's going to be ups and downs, but we're all in this together and we're really hoping that things go better for you on the next try. So then my second champion shout out goes to someone who I want to congratulate. This is uh, Samara who just passed social studies with a 169, which is a really high score and is taking science pretty soon. So we want to wish her the best of luck with the science and congratulate her. She says, thank you so much. I watched the social studies one yesterday and passed with a 169. It's taking the science Thursday, but watching your videos made me confident. So congratulations, Samara. The next question says, consider the table above. What was the mean number of female senators between the 102nd to 107th sessions of Congress, rounded to the nearest tenth? So in other words, you have to look at all of the sessions of Congress from 102 to 107. So in other words, all of these sessions of Congress, and tell me what is the mean, round it to the nearest tenth. All right, you can use your calculator if you want to. So let's have you pause the video. If you want to try this out and then when you're ready we'll go over how to do it okay so the mean just means the average and some students are sometimes surprised when they come across math questions on GED social studies but mean median mode and range questions do come up on GED social studies so you do need to know how to solve these now by learning how to solve these questions you're actually increasing your odds of passing math and science as well because mean median mode and range are a fair game for science, math, and social studies. Now, I know some GED instructors have their students go over mean, medium, and range questions every single week just because it shows up so many times. Now, that may or may not be overkill for you, but uh, the point I wanna make here is that these questions are really important and they do show up on social studies. So all you wanna do to solve them is you wanna take all of the numbers that are uh, in our data set here. Okay, since so asking us about the number of female senators, what I want to do is take my two, take my six, take my eight, all right, and take my nine and my other nine and my 13, and I'm going to add these all up, and then I'm going to divide by the total number of numbers in my data set, all right? So I have one, two, three, four, five, six different values or numbers in my data set. All right, so I'm going to divide by six. So again, and you're welcome to use your calculator. In fact, you're probably going to want to use your calculator to solve this. You just take all of the, the values here, all right, under the column number of female senators in the U.S. Congress. Again, I have my two, my six, my eight, my nine, my nine, my 13. You add them up and you divide by six. The reason you divide by six is because, again, if we count these up, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six numbers in our data set here. All right now, when I plugged that in my calculator, I got something like 7.8333, a bunch of threes like that. So round to the near, rounding to the nearest tenth, we see that A is the correct answer here. All right, so that's how you find the mean. Okay, so the next question, it's the same numbers, the same data, everything's the same, except now it says, consider the number of female senators between the 102nd to 107th sessions of Congress in the table above. So now I want you to find the mode, right? So I want you to look at the number of female senators in the US Congress, look at all these numbers here, and tell me what is the mode of this data set. So let's have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it.
So the mean is just means the average, and you add up all the numbers, divide by the total number of numbers in the data set, that's going to give you the mean. I know I'm talking super fast, but I, I just think repetition is important to learn the information. But we're not talking about the mean anymore. We are now talking about the mode. The mode is the most occurring number in the data set. Okay, so the most occurring number here is 9. Everything else shows up just once, but we see that there are two 9s. So the answer to this is simply 9. So the next question deals with that exact same data set, but this time it's asking you what is the median rounded to the nearest tenth. So this time I'd like you to try to find the median, and you can pause the video, try this out, use a calculator if you want, and then when you're ready we'll go over the question. Okay, so the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number, and the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. Now, a very, very, very common mistake. Uh, for some reason, a lot of students often find it easy to remember that the median is the middle number. And what they'll do is they'll just kind of list the numbers out in whatever order they're given, and they'll look for the middle number and say, oh, that's the median. But not so fast, all right? You have to put the numbers in order from smallest to largest first before you look for the middle number. If you don't do this, you're going to be out of luck because it's going to get you the wrong answer. So remember, the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number, and the median is the middle number when the order numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. So fortunately, if we just kind of go down from 2 to 6 to 8 to 9, 9, 13, the numbers are already more or less ordered from smallest to largest here, all right? So we don't have to worry about that here. So again, the numbers here are ordered from smallest to largest, so we don't have to reorder them. And in this case, there's an even number of numbers that we're working with, all right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. So whenever you have to find the median, whenever there's an even number of numbers, you have to look at the two numbers that are in the middle, and you have to add those up and divide by two, all right? So again, the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest, and then when there's an even number of numbers in your data set, you're going to have to look at the two numbers in the middle and divide by two. Now, I know somebody on their test is going to get a question where you have to take, where you get an even number of numbers and you have to find the median. I know someone watching this right now, maybe you was going to get a question like this on your test, and so you're going to remember that, first of all, it's median, so I have to put the numbers in order from smallest to largest. And since there's an even number of numbers here, I have to find the two numbers in the middle, add them up, and divide by two. And once you remember that on your test, if you get this question on your test and you remember how to do that, then hopefully that helps you pass. But at any rate, this is how you do a question like this, okay? So if there's an odd number of numbers here, all you have to do, they make life so much easier. Like, for example, um, let's say here, let me go back to our set. Let's say we didn't have this 13. If all we had was 2, 6, 8, 9, and 9, all you would have to do is look at the middle number and you'd see that, that it would be 8. So again, if there's an odd number of numbers in your data set, which in this case there would be 5 if we pretend we don't have a 13, you just put them in order from smallest to largest and you just pick out that middle number and you're done. But when there's an even number of numbers in your data set, to find the median, you first put the numbers in order from smallest to largest, then you find the two numbers in the middle, you add them up and divide by two. All right, so hopefully you're getting sick and tired of me saying that the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number, and the median is the middle number when you, number the order, when you order the numbers from smallest to largest. All right, hopefully you're getting tired of me saying that. That hopefully means that it's sinking in because you're going to get something like this on your test. I can almost guarantee it, and hopefully you'll remember that. But the answer here is 8.5. All right, so if you got that great work, if not, hopefully you understand how I did that. All right, so now we've got this data set yet again here, the same exact data set, and we are now looking for the range. So I'd like you to, again, revisit the same data set, and this time tell me what is the range. Okay, so the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number, the median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest, and the range is the difference between the biggest and the smallest number. Okay, so to find the range, all you have to do is pick out the biggest number in the data set, which is 13, and you're going to pick out the smallest number, and you just subtract it from the biggest number. Okay, so 13 minus 2 is going to be 11. So that's all you do to find the range. Now, 
I know someone down there in the comments is going to reply and they're going to uh, comment down below and say, oh, well, I got so tired of you repeating the mean over and over and over again. Well, I'm going to repeat it one more time. The mean means the average. The mode is the most occurring number. The median is the middle number when the numbers are ordered from smallest to largest. And the range is the biggest number minus the smallest number. All right. So sorry to just beat that to death, but I would rather give you more information than not enough. And I guarantee someone's going to comment down below and say that they got really annoyed and, and, and they were just really annoyed to the point where they just couldn't take it because I repeated that so many times. And I'm going to reply and say something like, hi, thank you for watching. Um, I'd rather you have more information than not enough. I'm going to probably say something like that. And, and that's how I really feel. I would rather you have more information. I would rather you hear this over and over and over again until you can repeat it because you've heard it so many times and then go in there and pass your test, then hear it one time and forget it, because there's so much stuff to know for your test that if you hear something one time, sometimes you might forget it. So I hope that this section of the video really helps sink in how to find the mean, the median, the mode, and the range. So one more time, the mean means the average, the mode is the most occurring number, the median is the middle number when uh, you order the numbers from smallest to largest. If there's an even number of numbers, you have to find the two numbers in the middle, add them up and divide by two. If it's an odd number of numbers, you just pick out the one in the middle. Once you've ordered the numbers from smallest to largest, that's going to give you the medium. The median and the range is just simply pick out the biggest number and subtract the smallest number. Okay. All right. Let's move on with our lives. Okay. The next question says, which of the following is the best example of propaganda? A, a magazine article quoting a governor who argues that the U.S. government should raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% of business owners. B, a booklet written by a Democratic group describing the history of labor unions. C, a pamphlet written by a conservative group describing the history of the U.S. Constitution. D, a wartime cartoon claiming that those who buy war bonds are heroes and that those who don't are helping the opposition. So now would be a good time to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so propaganda is basically, very simply put, propaganda is trying to change someone's mind or their point of view, typically using um, appealing to someone's emotions. Um, it's typically in a deceptive way, like either it could be outright lies, or it could be, you know, something that is has some truth to it, but is blown out of proportion. Um, but either way you look at it, propaganda is trying to change someone's mind, typically by appealing to their emotions. This could be something that, you know, someone reads. It could be something they see on TV. It could be a poster or an image or a graphic. Okay, and propaganda is a, a very broad and complex topic. Um, but so I'm just explaining as simply as I can the basic definition of propaganda. So A says a magazine article quoting a governor who argues that the U.S. government should raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% of business owners. So the governor might be using propaganda here, um, but if all the magazine is doing is quoting that person, that would not be the best example of propaganda. Okay, so again, it's asking what's the best example of propaganda. So it's not clear if the governor is using propaganda, but whatever the governor is saying here, if the magazine is just quoting that person, all right, that's that's not really a strong example of propaganda, okay? Depending on how you look at it, you know, sure, if the governor is using propaganda, I guess it could be an example of propaganda here, but this is not the best answer, all right? B, a booklet written by a Democratic group describing the history of labor unions. So just because it's a Democratic group, if, if what they're doing is just using the facts and explaining the history of labor unions, all right, that's not propaganda. That's not necessarily appealing to someone's emotions to try to change their mind. That's just describing, you know, in factual terms, the history of labor unions. So that would not be considered propaganda. Okay. Now C here, a pamphlet written by a conservative group. So it's really the same thing as B, the same idea here. Uh, if they're just describing the history of the U.S. Constitution and sticking to facts and things like that, that would not be considered propaganda. Okay. So both B and C, if you pick either of those choices, you know, just understand that, you know, just because it's a democratic group, they might have certain things that they believe. Um, but if they're just giving you facts about the history of labor unions, that's not propaganda. Same with the conservative group. All right. The conservative group obviously is going to have certain things that they believe. But just describing the history of the Constitution, does that constitute propaganda? OK, so. Let's think about D now. A wartime cartoon claiming that those who buy war bonds are heroes and that those who don't are helping the opposition. So 
basically the GED social studies test, you know, for some reason they love things to do with wartime cartoons. I'm not sure why. It's another one of those things that come up a lot, things to do with wartime cartoons. But um, basically here, you know, there's a war going on and the government needs people to buy war bonds. They need people to give money to help support the war. So they're, you know, the cartoon is trying to show those people that buy war bonds as heroes. And it's trying to state that, you know, basically shame people that aren't buying war bonds by telling them that, hey, you're helping the other side if you're not buying these bonds. Now, all right, uh, there's maybe some truth in here that obviously if you're buying a war bond that is going to help support the effort. All right. But, you know, maybe someone can't afford to buy the bonds or whatever that, and, you know, they, they would love to help with the war effort if they could. They want to help their country, but maybe they don't have the money to buy war bonds. So. Just because you don't buy a war bond, that doesn't, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you want to help the opposition, all right? So that's that's why this is propaganda in this example here, all right? It's trying to change someone's mind using by appealing to their emotions, essentially trying to shame those that aren't buying war bonds. When in reality, maybe there's they have different reasons for not buying bonds besides the fact that they want to help the opposition. So they might very well want nothing to do with helping the other side. They're just not buying war bonds for their own personal reasons, all right? That's what makes this propaganda. It is basically just using appeals to emotions and just kind of trying to basically shame people to buy war bonds and depicting those that do as good and those that don't as bad, all right? So that's why this is propaganda. Hopefully that's clear. On November 19th, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address. President Lincoln connected the struggles of the Civil War to the time period when the Declaration of Independence was signed. President Lincoln emphasized liberty and equality in his speech. Many historians now consider Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to be one of the greatest and most influential speeches in American history. Now, we see a timeline right here on the screen. The values say 1840, 1845, 1850, 1855, 1860, 1865, 1870, and 1875. I like to read those numbers out for those who are on a cell phone or another smaller screen device who may have trouble seeing them. And the instruction says, please place a dot on the timeline above on the year when Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address. Now, obviously you can't physically draw uh, a a dot on the screen, but imagine if you could, where would you put the dot? So let's have you pause the video, try this one out, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so it says here 1863 was when Lincoln delivered the address. So right here is 1860, right here is 1865. So somewhere around here. So as long as you saw that, the dot should be somewhere around here. Okay, then you got the right answer. In the 2022 Pennsylvania Senate race, the Democratic candidate received 51.3% of the vote and the Republican candidate received 46.3% of the vote. In red counties, the majority voted for Republican candidates, whereas in blue counties, the majority voted for the Democratic candidates. Now we see a map of Pennsylvania over here on the right and we see all the Pennsylvania counties and we see that they're either in blue or red. Now. This down here, this image attribution, this has nothing to do with the question. This is just me giving credit for the use of the image. Now it says here, overall, in which region of Pennsylvania did the Democratic candidate receive the most votes? Was it the north, the south, the east, or the west? So let's have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so first of all, just to get us oriented here, this is the north, this is the south, this is the east, this is the West over here. Where do I have room? I'll put it up here. Okay, so hopefully you, you saw that. All right, that's going to be the same for the entire map of the U.S. All right, so basically we know that in the blue counties, these blue counties are uh, Democratic counties. They receive majority votes for the Democratic candidate. And the red are going to be the Republicans, or at least where the majority of people voted for the Republican candidate. Now, if we look here at the northern portion, we see that this is all red, with the exception of this one county right here, which this is actually uh, Erie, which is on Lake Erie, just a little trivia fact, which is one of the uh, major lakes. Um, but anyway, 
So north is mostly very red with one exception. And now if we look at the western portion here, we see that this is basically all red. The only exceptions would be, you know, Erie up here, which is in the northwestern corner. And then this county right here, which is where Pittsburgh is. Uh, so west is also mostly red with a few exceptions. Same with south here. So south is very red with the exception being this kind of southeast corner over here. But if we look at the eastern corner, corner right here, right, basically everything here in the east is in blue with the exception of these two counties up here, which are red. But if we're looking for the region where the Democratic candidate received the most votes, we see that the eastern counties are mostly blue. All right, so we would say that C, the east, is the correct answer. Okay, so the next question, it's basically the same map, and this little blurb up here is still exactly the same, but the question is now changed to this. If the Democratic candidate received the majority of votes in Center County, which county is most likely Center County? Is it County A, County B, County C, or is it County D? Okay. So I'd like you to pause the video, take all the time you need on this, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the question. Okay, so basically, remember that, again, the blue counties are the Democratic counties, and the red ones are the Republican, or at least where the majority vote Republican, and the blue were where the majority voted Democrat in this specific 2022 Pennsylvania Senate election. Okay, so B, C, and D are red counties. A is a Democratic county, so we know that the majority of candidates in uh, Center County voted Democrat. We know that this is a blue, this is the only blue county labeled so logically, just by applying logic. We would have to say that County A is the only possible choice here because the other counties are, are red counties. So A is the correct answer here. So this might be the most important question on the test. Which Pennsylvania sports team does Parker chair for? Is it A, Philadelphia, or B, Pittsburgh? Okay, I'm just joking. This is this is just a joke question, all right? If you've already watched my channel for some time now, you probably already know the answer to this, but this question is just a joke, so let's move on to the next real question. In order for a bill to become a law, the bill is introduced by either a representative or senator into his or her respective chamber of Congress. If the majority in the first chamber vote in favor of the bill, the bill goes to the second chamber. If the bill passes in the second chamber, based on a majority vote, the bill next goes to the U.S. president. The president can then approve, veto, or defer action on the bill. If the president vetoes the bill, it goes back to Congress, and if two-thirds majority vote in favor of the bill, it becomes a law. The bill will automatically become a law after 10 days of no action from the president if Congress is in session. Now we see a flowchart over here. One says idea for a new law. Two, bill passes in first chamber. Three, goes to second chamber. Four, passes in second chamber. Five, goes to president. And five, passed or vetoed. So the first question, it says... The first question that has to deal with this paragraph in uh, flowchart says, what is the best title for the flowchart? A, a history of bills that were vetoed. B, how a bill becomes a law. C, how senators and representatives are elected. And D, what happens when a president defers action on a bill. So let's have you pause the video, try this question out, and then you know the drill by now. If you made it this far into the video, you're doing great. Unpause the video when you're ready, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so... Whenever you get a question like this, what is the best title for the flowchart? Really, this is another way of asking you, what is the main idea of the flowchart, okay? And we can take the information in the passage and the flowchart together in our answer to this. Um, but basically, what's happening here, it's not giving you the history of, of bills that were vetoed, all right? And it's also, it, it has to do with senators and representatives, according to the, pa the uh, passage here. But that's not the main idea. And the same with D. What happens when a president defers action on a bill? Okay, so what happens when a president defers action on a bill is that is uh, something that's mentioned here in the passage here. It says that it'll become a law basically after 10 days of no action from the president of Congress is in session. But that's not the main idea of the flowchart. All right, so what this whole flowchart is showing us 
is, and this is oversimplified, of course, but from start to finish, the process of how a bill becomes a law, all right? Starts with step one, goes through step five, uh, and this should really say six, so this is really a typo here. This should really say six, uh, but basically, this is the best answer here. The best title for the flowchart, you could really just put a big box up here and just title this, How a Bill Becomes a Law, because that is exactly what's being shown here. So for a question like this, you know, I know this might seem simple and straightforward to some, but you might get a question like this on your test. Um, you know, just, just keep it simple. Don't overthink it. You know, use the information in the passage. Use what's going on here. Just think, what's the main idea? What is the big thing that this flowchart is showing, okay? You know, something like answer choice D, what happens when a president defers action on a bill? Or like C, how senators and representatives are elected? Uh, you know, the passage mentioned senators and representatives and it talked about deferring action on a bill, but that's not the main idea of what's going on here. All right, so just keep that in mind for a question like this. What is the main idea? Okay, so the next question says, suppose Jared gets an idea for a new law. Which step should Jared take first? Should he A, contact his local senator or representative, B, contact his local mayor, C, contact the U.S. president, or D, send the idea to the second chamber? So you can use the passage, you can use the flowchart, you can use both. Let's have you pause the video if you'd like to, try this one out, and then when you're ready, let's go talk about it. Okay, so let's talk about the answer to this question here. So basically, what he's going to do first is he's going to have to contact either his local senator or representative. Okay, contacting the mayor is probably not going to help. He's probably not going to be able to contact the U.S. president, right? If you try to write a letter or send an email or something, it's probably going to be picked up by some secretary or something like that. Uh, so very, very unlikely he would get through to the president. And sending the idea to the second chamber, that comes a lot farther along in the process. So the first step, how a bill becomes a law, is someone gets the idea for that law and they are going to contact either their local senator or their local representative. So now suppose that Jared's local senator introduces his idea for a new law to the Senate where the bill receives a majority vote. What's going to happen next? A. Will the bill go to the president? B. The bill gets vetoed. C. The bill goes to the House of Representatives. Or D. The bill gets deferred. So let's have you pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the question. Okay, so basically, where are we in the process here? Well, Jared already had his idea, and he sent it to his local senator, and the senator introduces the bill, and fortunately for Jared, the bill is going to uh, pass the Senate, so now it's going to go to the second chamber, and what is the second chamber in this case? Well, in this case, the second chamber is the House of Representatives, okay? Uh, and so having it go to the president, if, if the majority of the representatives in the House uh, vote on the bill, then it's going to go to the president, all right? But he's not that far along yet. And as far as uh, the bill getting vetoed, that's something only the president can do. So the bill's not that far along in the process yet. And as far as the bill getting deferred, that's something that the president can do once the bill's been sent to the president. So the bill's not that far along yet, so C is the correct answer here. Come to think of it, I don't think I had the word deferred spelled right in the answer choice D. Uh, so if you notice that, yeah, I didn't spell that right, I don't think. Um, so sorry about my uh, spelling error in that answer choice, but... Right now, we're all about this next question here that says, suppose that instead of taking his idea to his local senator, once Jared got the idea for a new law, he brought that idea to his local representative. If the bill passes in the House of Representatives, where will it go next? Does the bill go to the president? Does it become a law after 10 days of no action? Does it go to the Senate? Or does it get sent right back to Jared with a note saying, sorry, Jared, you're out of luck? All right, let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the question. Okay, so basically what I want you to see here is that Jared can take the bill or his idea for the law to either his senator or his representative. So in the last question, he went and took it to his senator. The senator introduced it in the Senate, and the majority of senators voted on it, so it got sent to the House. So in this alternate reality now, 
in an alternate dimension, suppose Jared instead took that bill to his local, or took his idea to, for the law to his local representative. The representative introduces it in the House, and the majority of representatives vote on it. What happens in that case is that the bill is going to go to the Senate. Okay, so in this alternative reality, all right, the bill, Jared introduced the bill to his uh, representative. The representative then uh, introduced it in the House. The majority of, of representatives voted for it. So then it goes to the Senate, all right? So what I really want you to see here is that there are two different chambers of Congress. There's the Senate and there's the House of Representatives. And for a bill to become a law, and, and now this is very simply put here, I'm, this is oversimplified, but a lot of the history and civics and stuff on the GED test, it's either oversimplified or, you know, it leaves out a lot of things just to, to kind of give you the main idea. So, so this is a lot more complicated than what I'm showing you right now. If you want to study this process on your own or study history, you know, you'll see. But basically, you know, there's two chambers of Congress. There's the House and the Senate. The bill has to pass in both houses before it's going to go to the president. And you can either introduce it to a representative who can then, you know, have the majority of, uh, if the majority of representatives then vote on it after it's introduced to the House, it goes to the second chamber, which is the Senate, or he can uh, have the, the senators vote on it first. And then if the senators, majority of them vote on it, it'll go to the House and then the, the representatives will vote for it majority vote for it, it'll go to the president, right? So hopefully this is making sense here. You know, I don't really know how else to teach this um, concept of how a bill becomes a law other than to kind of quiz you on it using these questions here. And, you know, this isn't stuff that you have to memorize, right? This is just kind of reading comprehension using a flow chart and using this passage here. But these questions do come up on the GED test, right? Just on the GED practice test that I looked at recently in a different video, was put out by the, I guess it wasn't recently, it was a long time ago now, but one of the practice test questions given out by the official GED testing service on a practice test that I looked at in another video had a question on how a bill becomes a law, all right? And, and there was uh, not stuff that you had to memorize. It gave you some a passage to use for that question, but the point is that these topics do come up on your test quite a bit, stuff having to do with how a bill becomes a law. Like I've said before in the video, you know, there's no way to know for sure which topics you're going to get because the tests are randomized, but this is just something it's good to have a general idea about. So I don't want you to make flashcards and memorize this stuff. It's probably not going to be a good use of your time, all right? But, you know, just have a general idea of how this process works, and it might help you out on your test. That's just my opinion. All right, let's go to the next question. The Grand River is a river in the state of Michigan and is a major tributary of Lake Michigan. The headwaters of the Grand River start in Jackson County, then flow through the cities of Jackson, Lansing, Ionia, Grand Rapids, and Grand Haven, among other cities. The word tributary in the passage above most likely means which of the following? Is it a smaller river flowing into a larger river or a lake? This should say, uh, all right, pretend I didn't just edit that and pretend I cut that part out of the video. Okay, it should say a smaller river flowing into a larger river or lake. Water located immediately downstream from a dam or bridge, larger river or lake flowing back into a river, creek, or stream due to circular movement of water counter to a main current, causing current to circulate backwards, the rocky or shallow part of a stream or a river with rough water. And so here on the screen, uh, we see a picture of part of the state of Michigan. Uh, the map of the entire state is not needed to answer the question. Um, but here's part of the river. This may or may not help you. Uh, it depends on if you want to use it or not. It's totally up to you to decide if you need to use this or not. Uh, so let's have you pause the video, try this one out, and remember that answer choice A says smaller river flowing into a larger river or lake. And we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's go over the answer choice here. So uh, the answer is here. So for questions like this, you know, it's always good to uh, look for that word in the passage. Um, on some of the practice tests I've seen, they actually bold that word for you. Um, so that might help you if they do that on the test. But, you know, it's always good to look for that word in the passage. Um, and basically, you can just kind of, for some of these questions here, there's not like an exact science here. This isn't like plugging numbers into a formula. You know, sometimes you just have to read the answer choices here and just kind of read them a couple times each in your head and just see if one of them jumps out at you is, is the right answer. One of them might just kind of feel right and you might get kind of an intuition. Um, you know, you might just have to also kind of think critically about each answer choice and think about the context here and just eliminate as many answer choices as you can. 
um, which that's just a general tip for your test, okay? Process of elimination is always worth doing whenever you can, even if you just cross out two answer choices, all right? And if you have to guess between two answer choices, you have a way higher odds of getting that question right than if you're guessing between four. All right, so sometimes you might just have to use process of elimination. Um, another way to think about this, and I'm not sure if anyone watching this thought about this or not, but um, you know, we know that this this river has some connection to like Michigan, and we see that the river starts down here in Jackson. All right, and we I guess we would assume that if the river is connected to uh, the lake somehow, we don't see a lake anywhere on this map, and we know that the river starts down here, but we don't see any lake anywhere. So maybe, just maybe, right, the river just keeps going all the way out here to Grand Haven, and maybe Lake Michigan is out here somewhere off of the screen. We're not sure exactly. It could be that Grand Haven is the last city, and then uh, there's Lake Michigan right there. But, you know, I, so at any rate, um, basically, you know, you can use the picture if needed, um, but yeah, unfortunately for questions like this, you just kind of have to try your best to use educated guesses here because it's not an exact art and science. Some people do really well with these questions. Some people struggle with them. Um, you know, it's just kind of luck of the draw, but let me give you one more tip here. And this is the case, actually not a good example of this tip, but sometimes if you have to guess, all right, you know, if you're guessing, always use process of elimination first to eliminate all the answer choices, even if it's just one answer choice that you eliminate. Do that first, and then, uh, you know, you can always try to guess the longest answer choice, all right? The longest and most detailed answer choice is often going to be the one you want to guess, but it's not always right. And in this case, C is the longest answer, but it's not the right answer here. But let me explain to you why that's the one that you do want to guess, though, if you have to, if you have nothing else to go off of. Um, you know, when test writers write the tests, all right, and assuming a person actually write these tests, it's not like, you know, AI or there's some robots or something that do it. And that's, that's a joke. All right. I, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe they do have AI and robots like writing these tests. Who knows? Uh, you know, that's never been confirmed or approved by the gene testing service. All right. I sound like a conspiracy theorist and I'm totally joking. You know, um, there's a person obviously that's going to write these questions and the person usually when they make up the answer choices, they are going to start by a lot of times putting the right answer as one of the answer choices. And that right answer usually has a lot of details and is specific because they put effort into writing that correct answer. But then they just get kind of lazy. And, and for the other answer choices that are wrong, they have to make up junk answers and they just don't put as much effort into those a lot of the time. And they don't care as much about those junk answers. So what you get is one answer choice that's long and detailed and then three other junk answer choices that the person just made up quickly because they want to just get the work done and you know get their paycheck. Um, and so basically that's why in many cases the longest answer choice and the one that's the most detailed is often the one that you want to guess simply because they put the most effort into writing that one, but that's not always true. Okay, so, you know, the point of this little rant here is that sometimes if you have nothing else to go off of, pick the longest answer choice if you have to guess. That's sometimes going to be right, but it's not always right, and in this case C is not right. Um, and the correct answer here is A, so hopefully you found that A was the right answer, however you got to that answer choice, but if not, don't worry about it. Um, you know, and I just threw out two other tips, multiple choice uh, test taking tips for you too, so hopefully, you know, those will be helpful for you too as well. Okay, so we're still using the same uh, passage in map here, but it says, one of the cities through which the Grand River flows was once famous for having a mile-long stretch consisting of 300 yard wide and 10 to 15 foot tall rapids. Which city is most likely the city once famous for this stretch of rapids? A. Jackson. B. Ionia. C. Grand Rapids. D. Grand Haven. Okay, so now would be a good time to pause the video, try this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so... One trick here that I want you to take away, not just uh, for this question, but uh, generally for GED social studies, is that sometimes what they'll do is they will uh, use like answer, they'll use words in the passage. And, you know, all you have to do is find the answer choice that uses those same words. And sometimes that is really that simple. Uh, and, you know, so here basically it's talking about a stretch of the river that used to have at one point a bunch of rapids well common sense would say that you know uh they're probably not going to name a region is is it more likely that a region that was famous for rapids is named jackson or grand rapids well probably grand rapids okay and obviously not every question will be this straightforward but you might i've seen questions on their practice test where it's pretty much this simple as 
you look at the answer choices, one of them has a word that, you know, shows up in the passage, and it's really all you have to do is just, you know, guess that like I'm showing you here. So this is what I kind of call the matching trick for multiple choice. And, you know, this isn't always going to work. You still have to use common sense and think critically, but sometimes it's really that simple, all right? There's going to be hard questions on the GED social studies test too, probably. It's not all going to be this simple, but, you know, don't be surprised if you've prepared well if some of the questions are this straightforward. The following inventions are shown in chronological order on the timeline below. Please use the timeline to answer the following question. Which of the following events succeeded the telegraph? Is it A, the steamboat, B, the electromagnetic motor, C, the cylinder printing press, or D, none of the above? And we see the timeline image down here. So pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so two words to be aware of. Uh, the word succeeded means something comes after an event, and preceded means it became before it, okay? So if you already knew that, then, you know, sorry I'm telling you something you already knew. If you didn't know that, then don't worry about it. That's just something that you'll want to file away in your memory bank in case it comes up on the test. So we're looking for which of the following events succeeded the telegraph. So the telegraph happened right here in 1844. And the one event that succeeded the telegraph, or came after it, was the cylinder printing press, all right? So the steamboat was in 1807, so the steamboat came earlier. Same with the electromagnetic motor. Uh, so really, the only answer choice, uh, really, well, besides D, that could be right is C, okay? Uh, and so D is wrong. It says none of the above. Well, actually, the cylinder printing press is the right answer here, so it is one of the above answer choices. Uh, now, just be aware if I were to flip this around and say which of the following events preceded the telegraph, all right, uh, that would then you would want to look for events like the electromagnetic motor and the steamboat that occurred before the telegraph, okay? So just keep that in mind here. Uh, and life will be good. So you might be wondering, is the real GED social studies test going to be harder than the questions in this video? And unfortunately, that's kind of a hard question to answer because everybody's different. Everyone's going to have a different opinion and a different experience. I will say this, the passages that you're likely to get on the real social studies test are probably going to be longer in many cases than the ones I have in this video. The reason for that is because, you know, it's not really that practical to fit super long passages into these videos because I haven't found a good way to put them on the screen. Now, I've been on YouTube since 2017, and I still haven't really came up with a good way to fit long passages up on the screen in a way that's going to make sense. So I don't have passages that are super long in this video. So you can expect you're probably going to get longer ones on the real test, so that might make it harder. Also, you're going to have the time ticking down on the real test and just generally the, the stress and the pressure that goes along with any test taking situation. So that could make the, the real test a, a little bit harder at least. Um, I also want to point out, whenever I'm asked this question, you know, is the real test going to be easier or harder than the practice material on my channel? Uh, you know, my answer is, is usually something like this, you know, the material that I put out here on this channel is to help you learn. So use these videos to help you learn, and then use the official GED Ready practice test from the GED test taking service to tell you if you're ready to pass or not, okay? Now, not everybody can afford those tests. They're not free, and, and I don't work for the GED testing service. I don't get paid to say this. I'm not sponsored by them. I have nothing to do with the GED testing service. I don't even know if they know that I exist. I, I'm just telling you this, you know, if you're able to afford it, which not everybody can, but ideally, you know, you'll you'll want to take at least one of those GED social studies, GED ready social studies practice tests from the official testing service and let that tell you, you know, how well you're likely to do on the real test. That's going to tell you if you're likely to pass the real thing. So use the videos here on my channel to learn. Use the practice material put out by the official testing service to tell you if you're ready or not for the real test. All right, that's just the way I look at it here. And, you know, that being said, I've had, I've been on YouTube since 2017. I tutored for quite a bit before I was on uh, YouTube. And, you know, I've had very, very, very good feedback, a lot of positive feedback from people that have used my other social studies videos and have had success with them. Everyone's different. I can't guarantee any specific results. I can't guarantee this video is going to be what does it for you that helps you finally pass social studies and move ahead. But I've tried my best to put together this video. Use it to learn. I hope it's helpful. Use the other videos on my channel to learn. And use the material by the official testing service to help you approximate your score and how well you're going to do. All right, so hopefully that answers the question. And uh, basically, if you really want to challenge, the next video here is the Champions Challenge. Now, if you're new to my channel here, the Champions Challenge is just... 
Uh, something I've been doing lately where I pick what I think, in my opinion, is the hardest question on the practice test, and I call that the Champion's Challenge question. So the next question is actually one of the hardest types of questions, not just in social studies, but on the entire GED, in my opinion. So I'm going to let you try that now. If you're feeling brave, you can try that Champion's Challenge question, see how it goes. Thank you so much for sticking with me so far. Ralph is doing research on GDP for a school project. He knows that the average GDP growth from 2017 to 2020 was 1 percent. However, he cannot find the GDP growth from 2019. What is the missing value? So you see the chart here, and so this is one of those write the answer in the box type of questions. We don't have multiple choice answers for this, so I'd like you to come up with your own answer. And I don't care how you round it, uh, just get, we'll just see if you get something close to what I show you here is the answer. So let's have you pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over how to do it. Okay, so how do we do a question like this? Well, let's think, how would we find the mean? Well, the way that we would find the mean, remember, the average just means the mean. All right, so this word average right here just means mean. So if we had to find that average, here's what we would do. All right, we would take all the numbers in the data set, and we would add them up to start. So we've got negative 0.49, but for 2019, we don't know what that is. So let's just leave that as an X for right now. And that's what we're really trying to find out here. So then we would add three, and then we would also add 2.33. Okay, so again, to find the mean, we would add each of these numbers up, and then we would divide by the total number of numbers in our data set. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, four numbers in our data set. So if we add these up and divide by four, we're going to get the mean. But wait a minute, they already told us the mean. They already told us that the mean is 1%. So I can simply put one right here. So all I have to do is I have to figure out what x is equal to, and I've got the answer. So what we can do to, to get us going here is we could multiply both sides of the equation by 4. So if I multiply by 4, the 4s are going to cancel out down here, and 4 times 1 is just 4. All right, so here's what I would be left with if I did that. Let me delete this. Let me delete this. So I would be left with 4 equals negative 0.49 plus x plus 3 plus 2.33. So what I'm going to do now is let me add all of these numbers up. So in my calculator, if I do negative 3.49 plus 3 plus 2.33, I get 1.84. So rewriting this is going to give me 4 equals x plus 1.84. And we want to get x by itself, because remember, this missing value right here, that's what our x is, and we're trying to find that missing value. So if I have x plus 1.84, uh, 1 yeah, 1 uh, let's see, uh, what I want to do is do subtraction, right? So I want to subtract 1.84 from both sides of my equation, okay? And so if I do that, I'm going to get 2.8. 1.6. Okay, so this is a hard question. Let me know down below, how did you do with this question? This is one of the hardest types of questions that you might get on the whole GED test.